We'll pick up. Uh, good morning. We'll morning. pick up right where we uh, left off. We were looking at um, looking at eigenvalues that we have called defective. So. This is in the context of um, solving the systems of linear homogeneous equations with constant coefficients. And we have a characteristic polynomial. And if we assume for simplicity that, that all of its roots are real, um, how do I want to say this? If we assume for simplicity that all of its roots are real and the eigenvalues are lambda i, then it will factor like x minus lambda, possibly raised to some power, minus another eigenvalue, possibly raised to some power. X minus lambda K, possibly raised to some power. And I mean, I say possibly, they're always raised to a power, but I mean, the power might be one. It might or might not be raised to some non-trivial power. And each of these eigenvalues needs to give us as many solutions as the power that it is being raised to. And the easiest way for that to happen would be if an eigenvalue had that many linearly independent eigenvectors. If that happened, we have, you know, V1 e to the lambda 2 1 t, V2 e to the lambda 1 t, up to Vn sub 1 e to the lambda 1 t, and those would be the solutions we're looking for. But there is no guarantee that that will happen, which puts us in, well, in the case I said we'd be looking at, if we have an defective eigenvalue, or we call it an eigenvalue defective, what we mean is that it has fewer eigenvectors. I mean, it's so hard to talk about this in a perfectly dramatical way. There are infinitely many eigenvectors, but fewer linearly independent eigenvectors than the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. Uh, these, these powers up here, remember, are the multiplicity. So we don't have as many eigenvectors as we want. And if the multiplicity is K, and we have Q 
fewer than k eigenvectors. Let's say we have n, we've probably used n for something. Let's say we have m eigenvectors. Then the defect of the eigenvalue is the number we want minus the number we actually have. We saw the situation in the two by two case. Um, in the two by two case, the only way this could happen is if there's only one eigenvalue and it has one eigenvector. And in that case, our characteristic polynomial looks like this. So we have an eigenvalue lambda with multiplicity two. We have only one eigenvector. So in that case, this eigenvalue lambda has a defect of one. Um, and in that case, we dealt with the defective eigenvalue using um, generalized eigenvectors. And that's just what we're going to do in general. And I wouldn't memorize all of what I'm going to put on the board, especially I wouldn't memorize the forms of the solutions. We're going to end up with a really ugly polynomial that I mean, you'll see me reading out of my notes. I just look it up if I need it. But we should certainly know in general what we are doing, which is, okay, say we have this eigenvalue. And it has a defect of R. Then we'll find an eigenvector. There is at least one eigenvector such that um, this solution, that so, there is at least one eigenvector. That sentence doesn't go on. Every eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. I mean, an infinite number of eigenvectors, but you know what I mean, at least one linearly independent eigenvector. And that eigenvector is a solution to this equation. We are then going to, um, form a chain of generalized eigenvectors. And if you remember what that was in the two by two case, we solve an equation like this, except instead of equaling zero, it equals the initial eigenvector. And in the two by two case, that was that. Um, that V1 was an eigenvector, that V2 is a generalized eigenvector. You use them to find the solutions. But if you have larger matrices and greater defects, there is nothing to stop you from continuing. 
And we're going to continue until we reach our defect. Um, so we're going to continue until we get A minus lambda I times V sub R equals V sub R minus one. And um, the only sort of restriction here is that, um, I mean, these Vs are generalized eigenvectors. Uh, notice that according to the way we've defined a generalized eigenvector, eigenvectors themselves are generalized eigenvectors. And, I just realized as I was starting this lecture today, I don't actually know um, if every eigenvector is going to result in a complete chain. By which I mean an eigenvector is, an eigenvalue is defective. But it still might have multiple eigenvectors, right? Like if its multiplicity is seven and its defect is five, it should have two eigenvectors. So what I realized I don't actually know if we're always going to get the complete chain all the way up to the um, defect. Or if at some point we might get an equation that doesn't have a solution, and then we have to start a new chain with a different eigenvector. But what I want to say is that there's always a chain. And it doesn't actually, I mean, it's a little embarrassing to get up here and realize that I just don't know something, but it doesn't matter ultimately. Um, if we don't have a complete chain, we start with another eigenvector and we create another chain. And eventually we will get a sufficient number of generalized eigenvectors. What I do know is never going to happen is that we have two eigenvectors and we create two chains and we can't build the number of generalized eigenvectors we need. That's never a worry. Let's, um, let's just look at this case anyway, where we have this perfect chain. So these generalized eigenvectors are going to give us solutions and they're going to give us all the solutions that we need. They're going to make up the defect. And what I told you, you shouldn't bother to memorize. You should know this idea, but in the two by two case, we ended up with a solution that just had a linear expression, a constant times the eigenvector plus the generalized eigenvector times e to the eigenvalue times t. Um, those, as we increase the defect and get more and more eigenvectors, the solutions we're going to get are going to have uglier and uglier polynomials in them. So say that this is the situation we have, then the generalized eigenvector that is also a real eigenvector is going to give us 
a solution as per usual. The first generalized eigenvector is going to give us a solution such as we saw in the two by two case. We're going to have this linear expression times e to the lambda t. X three, let's see if I can figure this out. We're going to have a V one and a T squared. And we're going to have a one half in front of that. And then we're going to have V two T and then we're going to have our third generalized eigenvector. So you see the polynomials went up in degree and the general equation is really really kind of messy from the case generalized eigenvector you're going to get as a solution one divided by a minus one factorial times the first generalized eigenvector times t raised to the power of k minus one plus, and now we're going to count down. So k minus one is going to become k minus two factorial, except for the subscripts. The subscripts count up. So V sub one counts up to V sub two, but the power of K also counts down. And if we keep counting up the subscript and counting down, both the power and the factorial, we wind up with one over two factorial, two factorial is two, times V to the K minus second, times T squared, plus then one factorial is one, so we don't bother writing either that, and we don't bother writing the first power either. And then we have the case generalized eigenvector by itself, E to the lambda T. And I mean, I guess I've, I've said this is ugly. I do think it's ugly. I mean, it's possible, I guess, to overstate it. I mean, back in the day, at least those of you who took out to this too with me, back in the day, I made you memorize the Taylor polynomials, and this isn't any uglier than the Taylor polynomials, but it's also a lot less important than the Taylor polynomials and a lot more specialized. To me, this is exactly the kind of thing that you do not memorize and just look it up if you need it. And 
And that's the end of this section, which I think is 5.5.